Bonjour Emma Klein, vous êtes née en Californie. Pourquoi cet endroit est-il si inhérent avec le fait de raconter des histoires Yeah, I mean, I think California is in so many ways kind of a, a fantasy machine. It's where we get a lot of our sort of cultural images and our narratives. Um, and I think growing up, I was really aware of it. Uh, I think anyone in California is aware of it. Um, but I think for me, I was always just drawn to the intimacy that reading provides. Um, I think there is a kind of unparalleled experience that a reader can have reading words that is so total and, and so engaging. And I love film and I love cinema, but to me, it's a different flavor of experience. Um, But I, I definitely notice in my own work, I'm really drawn to imagery. And that to me is where sort of cinema shows up in my own work is sort of what is the scene? What are these like moments? Que ce soit dans The Girls, basé sur l'histoire de Charles Manson ou Harvey à la table ronde, vous vous inspirez de personnes qui ont réellement existé. Pourquoi sont-elles inspirantes I mean, I think in a lot of ways I'm following what I'm interested in. Um, and these people or situations fascinate me. And writing about them is a way to kind of work out what I think about them or kind of digest all this imagery and sort of see what, what bubbles up as a response. And I think I'm definitely interested in these mythic cultural tropes. And for me growing up, that was the Manson family, which was so, you know, formative in California history. Um, and then recently, of course, you know, the Harvey Weinstein trials, that's such a dominant uh, shaping narrative in, in our culture. And I am always interested in sort of what is behind the news story. News stories are, you know, by necessity, fact-based, they're very black and white, and I'm always interested in what the humanity behind that looks like. Um, yeah. Et en quoi la fiction peut-elle nous donner un autre regard sur elle? I mean, I think that's the great delight of fiction and why I would never, you know, write non-fiction about these um, topics or issues is because for me, It's not about the facts. It's not about an allegiance to the actual people or the actual narratives. It's trying to see what in this dynamic is most human. Um, and how can I sort of imagine the consciousnesses at work? Um, it's one thing to sort of say, Harvey Weinstein is a monster. He did X, Y, and Z, therefore X, Y, and Z. And fiction kind of opens up this world where in no way am I a judge or a jury on what Harvey Weinstein did, but just to explore a consciousness that's so different and sort of think about how someone like that could even come to exist or sort of how would they experience their own life. And to me, that's so fascinating and, and hard to do in any other realm but fiction. Le producteur de cinéma Harvey Weinstein était perçu comme un dieu à Hollywood. Pourquoi voulez-vous montrer son déclin? Yeah, I think to me, I was really drawn to this moment where somebody who had so much power, who was, you know, coddled and excused and, uh, you know, taken care of, uh, given a pass in so many ways, the one moment where he starts to realize that might not be the case moving forward, that maybe things aren't going to work out well for him. And to me, there's just something about that moment, that like barest shift in a narcissist's brain um, that just seemed really fascinating to me. Uh, you know, I think the way that that novella started was reading an article about him where he said, you know, after he got convicted, he was so, you know, he truly believed he would be found innocent. And there's something about that, that belief that you are a good person, even Harvey Weinstein thinks he's a good person, and wanting to see that crumble a little bit, or just very lightly start to, you know, show cracks. 
Qui était Harvey en réalité, si ce n'est une silhouette en carton Et comment êtes-vous entré dans sa peau et dans son déni permanent des accusations Yeah, I'm, you know, I didn't find it that difficult, strangely. I think in some ways it felt freeing to imagine this consciousness that, you know, did not have the normal checks and balances, was not concerned with morality or what was correct, but there was almost just this ego monster that just wants to consume everything in its path, basically. And uh, yeah, I think, again, I always just think, especially with that book, it's like Harvey Weinstein, the character of Harvey, you know, still has to eat breakfast, still has to get dressed, still has to brush his teeth or whatever. And in those moments, you know, I can, I can inhabit him more easily. And that kind of makes it easier also to try to understand sort of what this consciousness looks like as it does more horrible things. Harvey Weinstein a induit le mouvement MeToo. Que ressentez-vous envers ce mouvement qui a secoué Hollywood et le monde entier? Definitely. Um, I mean, I think it's really necessary and in so many ways it's been beneficial But I do think there's been an over-focusing on individual narratives, um, sort of pressuring women to be the ones to, you know, provide social change instead of there being larger structures offered by, you know, the government that would help those changes. And I feel like there's a hyper-focus on these kinds of stories with Weinstein or the like where it's very powerful people in very rarefied industries. And I think we can sort of go through the trial of Harvey Weinstein and say, okay, he's been convicted, he's in jail, the problem is over. But to me, it's much more systemic and should be approached more systemically instead of the way we've atomized it. So individuals feel that they should be the ones adjudicating these kinds of things. Pourquoi la domination, le pouvoir et la violence, particulièrement envers les femmes, sont si présents dans vos livres I think because it's so present in the world, um, and certainly in my experience of it, uh, it's never a conscious thing to me to, you know, I never think before I write, oh, I'm going to cover this topic and this topic and this topic. I think it's just naturally sort of what you see in the world around you that bubbles up in your writing. Um, and for me, it's very hard to not see, you know, violence. It's very omnipresent in everything that I'm exposed to. And then also power dynamics. Uh, I think there's that great quote that's like, everything is about power except for, oh wait, no, I, I messed it up. <laughs> Basically, the gist is, it's all about power. Est-ce que la littérature pourrait changer les choses? Yeah, it's so funny. I, I'm of two minds about sort of the role of literature. On one hand, I think literature does give us the experience of, you know, extreme empathy, you know, dropping into someone else's consciousness, you know, by necessity to me, seems like it would expand your vision of, sort of how the world could be or just being open in a sense to the fact that everyone else has a different reality than you, yours. And that alone is a profound shift for a lot of people. At the same time, I think I really resist the idea that literature should teach us things or, you know, be a avenue for social activism. For me personally, I don't look to my writing as a form of activism. I think activism is great for activism. I think writing is great for writing. I, I think of them as two very different things. And I, I do see some danger in conflating the two, um, partially because I don't want books sometimes to teach me anything. Uh, books that have a moral, books that want to educate you, I find as a reader, I resist that. Um, And, and I think there's some conversation now, or I've noticed it anyway, about, you know, this character is a bad person, so we can't read about this character. And I think that, that to me is a very tricky conversation and really 
antithetical to the point of literature. Um, so I think that's another reason why I, I kind of want to keep those two things separate. 